Good evening and welcome to, uh, to all. This is the Metropolitan AME Church School Black History Program. My name is Clarence Hunter and I will be your master ceremony this afternoon or this evening really. Mm -hmm. And I'm being ably assisted by Janice Murray, Eugenia Jacobs and Mary Oxendine. And those are the ones who are really making this happen. So without further ado, we're going to go into our opening which will consist of a, a song, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, followed by a welcome by the Crater Roll and Beginners, and the Apostles' Creed, Summary of the Decalogue, and an opening prayer in scripture by the primaries. So without further ado, we will begin the song.
Talk to Mr. Ponson at e Church School. We are so glad to see you today. Thank you for coming to the Black Treasury Program. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. The summary of the Decalogue. Hear what Christ our Savior says, Thou shalt love thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like into it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and, and the prophet's glory to be, to be the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now shall be the world without an end. Amen. Amen. Three. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Psalm 32, a new international version. All right, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, I'm back again. And uh, Black History Month was started as Black History Week by Carter G. Woodson in 1926. Uh, originally, it was a week and over time, it has grown to a month. Uh, Martin Luther King said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of, com of, of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Well, this month, the Black, the history for this month's uh, Black history, for this year's Black History Month is Black Resistance. And it is a call for everyone to study the history of Black Americans' response so that they can establish a safe space or environment where Black life can be sustained, fortified, and respected. Our theme here tonight at Metropolitan is Black Resistance, the AME Church. And we wanna look at what part the Metropolitan and the uh, AME connection in general play in the establishment of, um, or, or in the black resistance. Uh, we will briefly take a look at, um, at some of, uh, some of the uh, connectional things that were done. And we'll also take a look at how members of our church uh, um, have contributed to the uh, black resistance. So our first presentation will be uh, Richard uh, Allen in establishing the AME Church. Brother Hunter. Yes. Um, Benji is on to do his part. If he could do his part before we start the video. Okay. All right. Is he ready? Okay. <laughs> so what is the AME Church? The what is it to Amy Church?
All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, again, the theme for the uh, for Black History Month is Black Resistance, and our our theme is Black Resistance, the AME Church. So our first presentation will be by the young adults, and uh, is Richard Allen and establishing the AME Church. Richard Allen was born into slavery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 14, 1760. Allen converted to the Methodism at the age of 17 after hearing a white itinerant Methodist preacher rail against slavery. His owner, who already sold Allen's mother and three of his siblings also converted the eventually and eventually allowed Allen to purchase his freedom for $2,000 which he was able to do so by 1783. Allen soon joined St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church where black and white people worshiped together. There, he became an assistant minister and conducted prayer meetings for the African-American. Frustrated with the limitations the church placed on him and black parishioners, which included segregating pews, Allen left the church as a part of a mass walkout with the intention of creating an independent Methodist church. Along with the Reverend Absalom Jones, who had also left St. George, Allen helped found the Free African Society, a non-denominational religious mutual aid society dedicated to helping the black community. In 1794, Allen and several other black Methodists founded the Bethel Church, a black Methodist meeting house in an old blacksmith shop. Mother Bethel eventually birthed the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the first national black church in the United States. Helped by his second wife, Sarah, Allen also helped to hide escape enslaved people as the basement of the Bethel Church was a stop on the Underground Railroad. In 1799, Allen became the first African-American to be ordained in the ministry of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Then in 1816, with support for representatives from other Black Methodist churches, Allen founded the first national Black church in the United States, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Allen was elected as the AME's church first bishop. Today, the AME Church boasts more than 2.5 million members. Allen died at his home on Spruce Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On March the 26th, 1831, he was laid to rest under Mother Bucca AME Church. All right, thank you. At this time, just before we go into uh, Henry McNeil Turner and, um, and the senior classes um, presentation, we're going to, I think we have the prayer ready now. Is that true, Janice? Yes, Xavier. Okay, so yes, Xavier, so we will have the uh, opening prayer. A little bit out of things, but prayer the same. Thank you. Dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord, this Black History Month, we thank you for all you have done. Thank you for making us brave against racism. Wow. Thank you for giving us the power to make schools for our people so we can grow and learn. Please watch over us, protect us, and help us live each other other up oh, is this week 
think in your name, amen. And amen, thank you so much. And to everyone, it's important that our youth, our cradle rollers, the beginners, the primaries participate in these type things because unless, if you aren't aware of it, there are those out there who are trying to suppress our history and, uh, and, and where we're coming from. So it's important that they get it from us. So moving uh, along, our next presentation is gonna be on uh, Henry McNeil Turner and the first mass protest. Uh, and that'll be by the senior class. Good morning, class. It's Black History Month. We are going to learn about Henry McNeil Turner. I think I know about him. Oh yeah? What do you know, Alana? One of the most influential African-American leaders in the late 19th century Georgia. Henry McNeil Turner was a pioneering church organizer and missionary for the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Georgia. Later rising to the rank of bishop. Ms. Ogzendine? Yes, Alana? Turner was also an active politician and Reconstruction Era state legislator from McCann, Georgia. Very good, Alana. Now let's see what Mr. Turner himself has to say. I was born in 1834 in Newberry Courthouse, South Carolina, to Sarah Greer and Hardy Turner. I myself was never enslaved. My paternal grandmother was a white plantation owner. My maternal grandfather arrived in North America aboard a slave ship but, according to family legend, was found to have a tattoo with a Mandingo coat of arms, signifying his royal status. The South Carolinians decided not to sell my grandfather into slavery and sent him to live with a Quaker family. Against great odds, I managed to receive an education. A South Carolina law firm employed me at age 15 to do janitorial tasks, and the firm's lawyers helped provide me with a well-rounded education. About a year earlier, I had been converted during a Methodist revival and decided I would one day become a preacher. After receiving my preacher's license in 1853, I traveled throughout the South as an itinerant evangelist. Much of my time was spent in Georgia, where I preached at revivals in Macon, Athens, and Atlanta. In 1856 I married Eliza Peacher, the daughter of a wealthy African-American house builder in Columbia, South Carolina. We had 14 children, only four of whom survived into adulthood. Ms. Ogzendine, this is really interesting. Now watch this. In 1858 my family and I journeyed north to St. Louis, Missouri, where I was accepted as a preacher in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I feared Southern legislation threatening the enslavement of free African-Americans. For the next five years, I filled pastorates in Baltimore, Maryland, and in Washington, D.C., and witnessed the outbreak of the Civil War. During my time in Washington, I befriended powerful Republican legislators. In 1863 I was instrumental in organizing the first regiment of U.S. colored troops in his own churchyard and was mustered into service as an army chaplain for that regiment. My regiment and I were involved in numerous battles in the Virginia Theater. And did you know, at the war's end, U.S. President Andrew Johnson reassigned Turner to a black regiment in Atlanta, but Turner resigned when he realized it already had a chaplain. He spent much of the next three years traveling throughout Georgia, helping to organize the African Methodist Episcopal Church in what was not always friendly territory. African Americans flocked to the new denomination, but the lack of trained pastors and adequate meeting space challenged Turner. And in 1867, after Congress passed the Reconstruction Acts, Turner switched his energies to politics. He helped organize Georgia's Republican Party. He served in the state's Constitutional Convention and then was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives, representing McCann. In 1868, and the vast majority of white legislators decided to expel their African-American peers on the grounds that office holding was a privilege denied those from a servile background, Turner delivered an eloquent speech from the floor. Unfortunately, it did little to sway his fellow legislators. Soon afterward Turner received threats from the Ku Klux Klan. Let's hear more from Mr. Turner. 
In 1869 I was appointed postmaster of Macon by U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant but was forced to resign a few weeks later under fire from allegations that I consorted with prostitutes and had passed defective currency. At the behest of the U.S. Congress, I did reclaim my legislative seat in 1870, but I was denied re-election in a fraud-filled contest a few months later. I moved to Savannah, where I worked at the Custom House and served as a pastor of the prestigious Street Phillips AME Church. In 1876 I was elected manager of the publishing house of the church. Four years later, in a hard-fought and controversial contest, I won election as the 12th bishop of the AME Church. Turner was an extremely vigorous and successful bishop. In 1885 he became the first AME bishop to ordain a woman, Sarah Ann Hughes, to the office of deacon. He wrote several publications in 1885. After his wife, Eliza, died in 1889, Turner eventually married three more times. Between 1891 and 1898, Turner traveled four times to Africa. He was instrumental in promoting the annual conferences in Liberia and Sierra Leone and in attaining a merger with the Ethiopian Church in South Africa. Turner also sought to promote the growth of the AME Church in Latin America, sending missionaries to Cuba and Mexico. With the support of white businessmen from Alabama, I helped organize the International Migration Society to promote the return of African Americans to Africa. To further the emigrationist cause, I established my own newspapers in which I was the editor, the voice of missions and later the voice of the people. Two ships with a total of 500 or more emigrants sailed to Liberia in 1895 and 1896, but a number returned, complaining about disease and the country's poor economic prospects. I remained an advocate of Back to Africa programs but was unable to make further headway against the negative reactions of returned emigrants. I felt increasingly estranged from the South. Turner died on May 8, 1915, in Windsor, Canada, while traveling on church business. He is buried in Atlanta. A portrait of Turner hangs in the state capitol. Author, Stephen Ward Angel, King Tisdall Cottage Foundation Incorporated, Florida A&M University. Reference, New Georgia Encyclopedia. The senior department thanks you for allowing us to share this information. Thank you. The, uh, for the next three presentations, we're going to uh, look at our local area. Uh, the first one will be uh, the first Amy Churches in, uh, in the District of Columbia, which will be presented by the intermediate class. The next one will be the, uh, a presentation on the actual establishment of Metropolitan AME Church. And the last presentation from the uh, men's Bible class will deal with the first bishops and uh, some of the key uh, people in the, um, in the church are the superintendents and first pastors. So without further ado, we'll start with the, uh, the first, uh, with the intermediate class. After the establishment of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1816, more African Americans were seeking religious freedom and were growing tired of the segregated day services of the predominantly white churches they were attending. Almost 33 years after Richard Allen and others left St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia and four years after the founding of AME Church, Blacks in the District of Columbia took a similar stand. Presenting the first African Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. will be Kyle Corbett and Graham Brown. Most of the information for our presentation was taken from research done by the church history historian, Ms. Thelma Jacobs. Israel Bethel AME Church. Prior to 1820, black Methodists, both freed and enslaved in Washington, DC were worshiping at the predominantly white Ebenezer Methodist Episcopal Church. However, because the worship services were so segregated, the black worshipers left to form their own church. In 1822, they petitioned to become a part of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Their petition was granted by the first bishop of the AME Church, Bishop Richard Allen. The first AME Church in the District of Columbia was known as Israel Bethel AME Church. The congregants first worship in a member's homes. In 1828, they purchased what was then the first Presbyterian church, which sat at the foot of Capitol Hill. 
Israel Bethel became one of the largest black churches in DC. The church's property was eventually purchased by the federal government. In 1873, Israel Bethel left the AME denomination in a dispute over church ownership. In 1838, a second AME church was established in DC, and it was known as Union Bethel AME Church. It wasn't originally considered a branch of Israel Bethel. It was primarily for those members who lived in the western part of DC who found it too difficult or too dangerous to travel the distance to Israel Bethel. In 1840, Union Bethel was admitted into the Baltimore Annual Conference. They first worshiped in a house near 15th and L Streets, Northwest, but a year later purchased a lot on M Street. It is believed that Union Bethel was a stop on the Underground Railroad. It was also served at both a religious as well as an academic institution when there were no public schools for Blacks in the city. Union Bethel was also noted for its aid to those who were formerly enslaved who came to the city from Maryland and Virginia. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in or around 1818 in Talbot County, Maryland. Douglas himself was never sure of his exact birth date. His mother was an enslaved black woman and his father was white of European descent. He was actually born Frederick August Washington Bailey and took his name Douglas only after he escaped. Douglas was separated from his mother as an infant. He worked on populations in Maryland from his from the age of six. He ended up in Baltimore and credits the slave owner's wife with first teaching him the alphabet. With that foundation, Douglas then taught himself to read and write. By the time he was hired out to work, he was teaching other enslaved people to read using the Bible. At age 16, because of his efforts uh, to educate, fellow enslaved people, he was transferred to a farmer known for his brutal treatment of the enslaved people and his charge. After several failed attempts to escape, Douglas finally left that farm in 1838 and finally arrived at an Augustus home in New York. Once settled in New York, he sent of Anna Murray, a free black woman from Baltimore, he met while in captivity. The two were married in September 1838. They had five children together. Douglas and his wife moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where Douglas began attending meetings of the Oblastimus movement. By 1843, Douglas had become of the American Anti-Slavery Society's 100 Conversations Project, a six-month tour through the United States, during which Douglas was physically assaulted several times. Frederick Douglas became a prominent activist, author, public speaker, and a leader in the author, public abolitionist movement. And after an enactment of the Impestimish Proclamation in 1862, Douglas continued to push for equality and human rights until his death in 1895. Douglas held numerous government appointments. In 1890, Frederick Douglas delivered a lecture, The Race Question, in multiple in at Metropolitan Amy Church. And in 1894, Douglas delivered last great speech, the lesson of the hour from the pulpit of Metropolitan. In 1895, his funeral service were held here at Metropolitan. There is a few in the sanctuary dedicated to Mr. Douglas and 
the lower audio channel is named in his honor. Thank you. I think next we have the um, the uh, first uh, or oh, the establishment of a metropolitan. Yes, next. Junior class. All right. Metropolitan AME Church was founded in 1838. It is the oldest AME Church and the oldest continuously black owned property in Washington, DC. The church represents the merger of two other congregations, Israel Bethel AME and Union Bethel AME. Both were stops on the Underground Railroad. The churches merged in the 1870s and the present name Metropolitan was officially designated and recognized by the General Conference of the AME Church in 1872. Here are the minutes of the, from the meeting organizing what was then called Union Bethel AME Church on July 6, 1838. Here's a photo of the stained glass window in Douglas Hall listing the original members of the church. Here's the church registry of members from June 1839. The conference gave instructions for the new church to be built in close proximity to the Capitol and the White House. In addition, each annual conference was requested to donate at least $100 to the building project. In gratitude, the church dedicated a stained glass window for each contributing annual conference. Here are some photos of the windows in the sanctuary. Construction began in 1880 and the cornerstone was laid in 1881. The new Metropolitan AME Church was dedicated in 1886. I would like to highlight two founding members of Metropolitan AME Church, Alethea Browning Tanner and John F. Cook Sr. Alethea Browning Tanner was born in 1781 on a plantation in Prince George's County. She and her sister sold vegetables at a market located in what is now Lafayette Park in front of the White House. She used the profits from her sales to purchase her freedom in 1810 for $1,400. She eventually purchased the freedoms of at least 18 other family members. She moved to Washington, D.C. and owned a store at 14th and 8th Street Northwest. She donated money for the establishment of the church. When the church fell into foreclosure, she and her family members stepped in and saved the church from the auction block. She not only raised money for the church, she also contributed money to establish the first school in DC for black children, the Bell School. She died in 1864. The park, Alethea Tanner Park at 227 Harry Thomas Way in Northeast was dedicated in her honor in 2020. John F. Cook was born in slavery in 1810. At 16, his freedom was purchased by his aunt Alethea Browning Tanner. Cook went to become a prominent figure in Washington, D.C.'s religious and educational community for freed Blacks. Cook apprenticed as a shoemaker and became assistant messenger for the United States Land Commissioner. Cook attended Smothers School in Washington, D.C. In 1834, he became head of the Smothers School and renamed it Union Seminary. Additionally, Cook founded the Young Men's Moral and Literary Society, an antebellum abolitionist debating society for free and enslaved Blacks. Cook was also a successful businessman. You've heard of the Tulsa riot and the Wilmington riot. In Washington, D.C. in 1835, there was the Snow Riot. The Snow Riot was a race riot in which whites targeted businesses owned by free Blacks that they considered competition. The Union Seminary School was destroyed and John Cook had to flee the city for his life in 1835 and did not return until 1836. He studied to become a minister and by 1838, he was a preacher at the Israel Bethel AME Church. In 1838, he co-founded Union Bethel AME Church, which eventually became Metropolitan AME Church. 
Cook eventually left the AME Church. In 1841, he was licensed as the first black Presbyterian preacher in Washington, D.C. That same year, he co-founded the first colored Presbyterian Church, which is now the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. He became its pastor in 1843 and served until his death in 1855. The John F. Cook School was established in 1867 by his sons, John F. Cook Jr. and George Cook, who were prominent businessmen and leaders in the black community. The school was located at O Street between 4th and 5th Streets Northwest. In 1926, the building was torn down and a new John F. Cook Elementary School was built on 30 P Street Northwest. My mother attended the John F. Cook Elementary School. The school closed in 2009 and in 2013 was renovated and repurposed as the Mundo Verde Bilingual Public Charter School. Thank you. And by the way, Eugenia, just so everyone knows, Ms. Thelma Jacobs is your mother. And she is on tonight. Okay, next we will have the, um, the men's Bible class uh, present some of the uh, first at Metropolitan. Good afternoon, Metropolitan Church School family. Theophilus G. Stewart was the first minister at Metropolitan AME. Theophilus was born April 17, 1843, to James Stewart and Rebecca Gould in Gould Town, New Jersey. He was the son of three blacks, reared in a family that stressed education. He received his former education in the Gould Town Public School. Brother Stewart was ordained a minister in the AME Church in 1863. Following the Civil War, Stewart helped organize the AME Church in South Carolina and Georgia. He was active in Reconstruction politics in Georgia. Stewart moved from South Carolina to pastor the AME Church in Macon, Georgia. March 17, 1868. However, after the church was burned in a mysterious fire, he literally and figuratively built a new AME church. Stewart graduated from the Episcopal Divinity School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and later was awarded a Doctor of Divinity degree from Wilberforce University in Wilberforce, Ohio. From 1872 to 1891, Reverend Stewart established a church in Haiti and preached in the eastern part of the United States. He passed it at Metropolitan AME from 1886 to 1888. In, 1899, in 1891, he joined the 25th U.S. Colored Infantry serving as his chaplain until 1907, including service in Cuba during the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. From 1907 to 1924, Reverend Stewart was a professor of history, French, and logic at Wilberforce University. He died January 11, 1924, and as Reverend Theophilus G. Stewart, Metropolitan's first minister. Uh, the first bishop from Metropolitan AME is George Dewey Robinson. George Dewey Robinson was born February 22nd, 1909, in Sumter, South Carolina, and came from an unbroken line of African Methodists dating back to the founding of their church in South Carolina. He graduated from Allen University in Columbia, South Carolina. He served churches in South Carolina, North Carolina, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Robinson was also a veteran. He served as a chaplain in the U.S. Army from 1941 until 1943. 
He was assigned to Metropolitan A and E in April 1951, and pastored there for over 17 years. All total throughout his career, he served as a pastor faithfully in a number of churches for over 30 years. He established numerous ministries while at Metropolitan that advanced the life of the church and the cause of the faithful. Robinson was elected the 85th Bishop of the AME Church in 1968 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. His first Episcopal assignment was to the 15th Episcopal District, which is the Republic of South Africa, in 1968. One of the greatest accomplishments, I should say one of his greatest accomplishments was the establishment of the publishing house that served the people of South Africa and advanced the cause of Christ. He also supervised the 18th district during a portion of his tenure in Africa. The 1972 General Conference assigned him to the 11th Episcopal District. However, barely a month into his assignment in the 11th district, Bishop Robinson was called from labor to reward on July 30th, 1972. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery in the Chaplain's Corner. And finally, as for Metropolitan AME First Church School Superintendent, that honor goes to Miss Maddie Amanda Bowen. However, unfortunately, I was uh, unable to find either a photograph or biographical information on Ms. Bowen. But she was the first. Uh, thank you. And thank you. Uh, our next is we're going to uh, have a poem um, by uh, Alana Maxwell followed by a song, Oh Freedom. But before we get into that, I know no one can hear, but we really should applaud our young people for doing an outstanding job. And to the young people, it's, it's to you that we depend to carry our story forward. Uh, there are a lot of efforts out here to suppress black history, but it's through you that our, our history will, will persevere, will be preserved, and, and, and our children, your children will know uh, the contributions that Blacks made. But thank you for the contributions that you've made to this program tonight. So now without further ado, we will go into the uh, poem by Alana Maxwell. Uh, and I believe that poem is uh, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was one of the first influential Black poets in American literature. He was born in Ohio in 1872 to parents who had been enslaved. Dunbar's father, Joshua, escaped from slavery in Kentucky and volunteered for the 55th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Dunbar's mother was his first teacher. Dunbar wrote his first poem at the age of six and gave his first public recital at the age of nine. After completing high school, Dunbar took a job as an elevator operator. In 1893, he printed his first collection of poetry, Oak and Ivy. Dunbar sold copies personally, often to passengers on his elevator. His writing garnered attention and sponsorships, allowing him to publish more poems, books, and plays, and travel internationally promoting his work. In 1897, Dunbar took a job at the Library of Congress and moved to Washington, D.C. with his wife, Alice Ruth Moore, who was also a writer and a poet. While living in D.C., he attended Metropolitan AME Church. A plaque in his honor is on a pew in the sanctuary. Dunbar soon left the job to focus on his writing. He died of tuberculosis in 1906 at the age of 33. He was interred in the Woodland Cemetery in Dayton. Much of Dunbar's more popular work in his lifetime was written in the Negro dialect. 
associated with the antebellum South. Lias? Lias? Bless the law. Don't you know the days are brought? If you don't get up, you scamp, there'll be trouble in this here camp. You think I'm going to let you sleep while I make your board and keep? That's a putty how to do. Lias, don't you hear me calling you? Bet if I come across this floor, you won't find no time to snow. Daylight all is shining in while you sleeping, while hits a sin. Hate the candle light enough to burn out without a snow, and you go to morning through burning up this daylight too. Lias, don't you hear me call? No use turning toward the wall. I could hear that matter squeak. Don't you hear me when I speak? This here clock done struck off six. Caroline, bring me them a sticks. Oh, you're down, sir. You down. Look here, and don't you dare to frown. Now you march yourself and you wash your face and don't you splatter all the place. I got something else to do, so I just clean up after you. And take that comb and fix your head. Look just like a feather bed. Look here, boy, I let you see you shame. Roll your eyes at me. Come and bring me that strap. Boy, I'll whoop you till you drap. You done felt yourself too strong and you surely got me wrong. Now sit down at that table there and just your whip if you dare. Every morning on this place seems like I must lose my grace. Now fold your hands and bow your head. And wait until the blessing said. Lord have mercy on our souls. Don't you dare touch them rolls. Bless the food we're going to eat. You sit still. I see your feet. You just try that trick again. Get us peace and joy. Amen. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. So our next, um, next we will have a, uh, uh, we will, are going to have um, uh, two presentations on the, uh, on the role of Metropolitan AME Church. Uh, the first one by uh, Miss Joan Oxidine will be on the role in the Underground Railroad, and the second one by Marsha Botts and Barbara Robinson will be uh, Metropolitan's role during the Civil War. The first African Americans arrived through Georgetown, Virginia, Jamestown, Virginia, in 1619 as indentured labor or servants. From about 1619 to 1640, the laws throughout Europe and the Americas removed all human individuality from abducted Africans and named them property. The US Supreme Court and chief justices like Roger B. Tanner ensured that the law did not protect slaves, but imbued their white oppressors 
who physically, mentally, and psychologically abused them with full supremacy. In 1640, Maryland became the first colony to institutionalize slavery in America. And in 1641, Massachusetts, in its written legislation titled Bodies of Liberty, stated that bondage was legal servitude. At that moment, changing the status of African heritage to automatic chattel slaves that could be bought and sold at the discretion of their white owners. The Willie Lynch letter or address in, making a, in the making of a slave was delivered by Willie Lynch on the banks of the James River in Virginia in 1712 regarding controlling slaves in the colony. I caught a whiff of a dead slave hanging from a tree a couple of miles back. You are not losing, you are not only losing valuable stock by hangings, you are having uprisings, slaves are running away, your crops are left in the fields too long for maximum profit. You suffer occasional fires, your animals are killed. Gentlemen, I'm here to introduce you to the method of solving your problem. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. Use the same principle used in breaking in a horse. You must break the will to resist. The beatings, hard labor, starvation diets, family separation, and lynching gave plenty cause to escape slavery. The Underground Railroad is a term used from about 1840 to describe an informal network of secret routes and safe houses used by fugitive slaves in the United States of America on their journey north to free states or Canada, also referred to as Canaan. It spanned 29 states as well as Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Quakers played an active part in it along with free Africans and others. It was called underground because it was secret and a railroad because it marked the journey of the freeing slaves to freedom. The safe houses that were used were known as stations and those who allowed their property to be used in this manner was known as station masters. Those who contributed money or goods to help were called stockholders. The fugitives were described as goods to help them be less easily identified. Conductors were those who planned the routes and often helped and accomplish and accompany the slaves on their bid to freedom. The fugitives moved during the hours of darkness from one station to the next. Stations were usually between 10 and 20 miles apart, and they either walked between them or were hidden in covered wagons or wagons that had false bottoms. The North Star was used as a guide to find the way. The date when the Underground Railroad started is uncertain. One of the earliest references to runaway slaves receiving organized assistance come from a letter written by George Washington in 1786. A slave escaped from one of his neighbors and Washington wrote to Robert Morris that a society of Quakers formed for such purpose have attempted to liberate him. Acting pungent to justice and in my opinion, extremely impolitic with respect to state. To the slave, to the fugitive slave freeing, fleeing a life of bondage, the North was the land of freedom, or so he or she thought. Upon arriving there, the fugitive found that though they were no longer slaves, neither were they free. African Americans in the North lived a strange state of semi freedom. The North may have emancipated the slaves but it was not ready to treat blacks as citizens or sometimes even human beings. This is where the concept of black and white started. 
By 1850, more than 5,000 people were working with the Underground Railroad. They risked both fines and imprisonment for trying to help the runaway slaves or fugitives from work, as they were called. African-Americans like Harriet Tubman, a former slave who made 19 journeys to help her family and then other slaves, probably made the greatest contribution. But many others were involved, drawn from Methodists, the AME Church, and other evangelical groups, as well as Quakers, like Levi Coffin, Isaiah Hopper, John Brown, and Thomas Garrett. William Steele was another station master on the Underground Railroad. A free born African American still chaired the Vigilance Committee of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, which gave out food and clothing, coordinated escapes, raised funds, and otherwise served as a one-stop social service shop for hundreds of fugitive slaves each year. The Project Gutenberg ebook on the Underground Railroad by William Steele may be read online. By the middle of the 19th century, it is estimated that over 50,000 slaves had escaped from the South using the Underground Railroad, of which Metropolitan was a stop. Plantation owners became concerned about the number of slaves who were managing to escape. And in 1850, persuaded Congress to pass the Fugitive Slave Act. Federal marshals who did not arrest an alleged runaway slave could be fined $1,000. People who aided the escapees by providing shelter, food, or other forms of assistance could be in prison up to six months and fined $1,000. The Fugitive Slave Act did not stop the Underground Railroad. It came to a natural end with the abolition of slavery at the end of the American Civil War. Okay, Marsha and Barbara. Okay, do we have them? Do, do we have Marsha and Bob, Barbara, are they on? I'm checking. Uh, Clarence, we yeah. sent on a recording. I hope it's there. Okay, we'll, we'll check on that. I tell you what, in the meantime, I tell you what, we can, we can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and look for that. But in the meantime, we will go ahead with the uh, next sketches that we have. And the next sketches are four sketches, one on Ida B. Wells, one on Rosa Parks, one on Betty Chavez, and the other one on Jarena Lee. And they will be given by uh, Ms. Leandra Kick, uh, Cook, Ms. Katie Blanding, Ms. Alfreda Horton, and Reverend Dr. Sandra Strong. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, Ida B. Wells and then uh, down through Rosa Parks, uh, Betty Chavez, and Darina Lee. Ms. Cook? Yes. Ida B. Wells, uh, she was born 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And uh, she uh, was best known uh, for being an investigative journalist. She spoke out boldly about lynching and the violence against Blacks uh, people in America. And uh, she was also a, a prominent figure in the women's suffrage movement. And she fought for women of all races to gain the right to vote. To vote. She was nicknamed the princess of the press because she was, was uh, so uh, uh, vibrant and, and, and gave so many uh, uh, great lectures and, and publications. She co-wrote a 90 page pamphlet with Frederick Douglass protesting the exclusion of Black people in the Chicago World's Fair. And uh, she also helped uh, form the NAACP and she formed the uh, National Association of Colored Women. And 71 years before Rosa Parks gave, refused to give up her seat 
uh, in, on the bus, Ida refused to give up her seat on a train in Memphis, Tennessee. And when the conductor tried to remove her from the train, she viciously bit that con con train conductor's hand and later sued Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Some of her AME church connections were, she formed the first black kindergarten classes at Bethel AME Church in Chicago. She also got married in Bethel AME Church of Chicago. And she traveled all over the United States and spoke uh, many times uh, 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 at AME churches and other churches. And she came to our church, Metropolitan, uh, in 1892, and uh, she uh, came twice, gave, gave, gave lectures on uh, fighting, um, how to fight uh, the, the, the violence that was being perpetrated against um, Black pe people in America. And um, she, in my opinion, was a great um, champion for justice, and uh, she also uh, was legendary and, and, and she was a hero in my opinion, a shero, my shero. That's, she has many more achievements, but I won't get into it right now, take of time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blanding. Rosa Louise Parks, born February 4th, 1913, died October 24th, 2005 was of course memorialized at Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. She was a faithful, lifelong member of the AME Church. Her faith was at the core of her involvement in the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955. With deep roots in the ethos of the AME Church, she felt the church had a responsibility to be active. And it was in the AME church, she learned her first lessons in civil disobedience. She said, and I quote, people should stand up for their rights, just as the children of Israel stood up to Pharaoh, end of quote. During his eulogy of Rosa Parks in 2005, the senior bishop of the AME Church, Philip R. Cousin, summed up her life as a diamond that had been polished by the hands of God. She formed the rock on which we now stand. Thank you. All right, Ms. Horton. Good evening. Betty Shabazz was a devout Christian prior to her marriage to Malcolm X. Not much is known about Betty's early childhood. However, she was raised by her adopted parents who were dedicated church members of the Bethel AME Church in Detroit, Michigan. Her teenage years were steeped in the AME doctrine. At age 13, Betty vowed she would die a Methodist. She sang in the Bethel AME Church Choir, attended Sunday school, active in vacation Bible school, and most of her friends and social activities were at the church. Her adopted father was superintendent of the church. Her mother taught Sunday school and led vacation Bible study. They were very dedicated to the church and widely respected in the church. Even Bethel AME and her parents covered Betty's tuition at Tuskegee Institution. It was there she studied nursing and became increasingly aware of the struggles of the black race. Until she encountered Malcolm X, she believed in the Christian faith. She converted to Islam in 1956 and married Malcolm in 1958 at the age of 23. After Malcolm's assassination, she dedicated her life to fighting for human rights and education. A few years before she died, she went back to Bethel AME Church to visit. The pastor, Reverend Norman Osborne, told her she was always welcome to come back when she was in Detroit. Betty Shabazz died at the age of 63 
having both Christian and Muslim speaking at her funeral. Thank you. All right, and Reverend Dr. Sandstrom. Thank you so much. It's really amazing how God moves according to purpose. Jer Mrs. Jarena Lee is a pioneer for justice. According to her autobiography, she was born on February the 11th, 1783 in Cape Cod, Maine, New Jersey and experienced a troubled childhood. Yet God called her to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ as the first woman licensed to preach within the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Although initially denied the right to preach by Bishop Richard Allen, the first bishop of the church, after eight years, he changed his mind. And according to her autobiography, Richard Allen changed his mind on Sunday in 1817. Richard Allen was attending Mother Bethel Church in Philadelphia. A former servant, Lee, had become a Christian nearly a decade before. And although she had expressed this calling to the church, Lee had never taken the pulpit. But on Sunday, in 1817, the Reverend Richard Williams was unable to speak the words he had prepared. Impulsively, Lee rose from her seat and addressed the congregation. During the exhortation, God made manifest his power in a matter sufficient to show the world according to Jarena Lee, that I was called to labor according to my ability and the grace given unto me in the vineyard of the good husbandman. And Lee later wrote, Richard Allen, the African Methodist Episcopal Church founder and denominational bishop was at Mother Bethel and heard her preach. Therefore, Richard Allen changed his mind after eight years, convinced that God's gift was operating in her because he witnessed it for himself. So following this, Lee was able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. She became a traveling preacher who walked over 2,325 miles and preached over 178 sermons in her lifetime. She preached the word of God. Even though she was married, she married a clergyman Pastor Joseph Williams in 1811 and bore two children, she did not preach while she was married to her husband. During that period of her life, because she knew that of her commitment, but she returned to preach the gospel and to be married to God after her husband died in 1819. So we honor the legacy of Mrs. Jarena Lee, who was a pioneer for justice and women's rights, and the first woman to preach the word of God publicly in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Thank you. And thank you.
Uh, do we have the Civil War sketch ready now? We are working on it. Okay, then in that case, we will go, go ahead and do the next uh, four sketches. Uh, these will be um, uh, on Ernie oh, Green. Hello, just, what do we got here? Okay, the first, uh, they will be uh, on Ernie Green, Mr. Ely, Judge Newman, and um, Elmer Henderson. And the presenters will be uh, Mr. Curry, Dr. Hogan, uh, Attorney McCann, and uh, myself. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Curry. Um, good evening. I'm honored to present a profile of Ernest Gideon Green Jr. He's born in Little Rock, Arkansas, September 22nd, 1941, to Lotharia and Ernest Green Sr. He had a brother, Scott, and a sister, Treplia. As a child, Green participated in church activities at the Bethel AME Church and was a member of the Boy Scouts of America, eventually earning the rank of Eagle Scout. He attended the segregated Dunbar Junior High School and graduated after ninth grade, at which time he was assigned to the Horse Man High School, a new high school for African-Americans. At the end of his junior year at Horse Man, Green volunteered to attend the all-white Little Rock Central High School in the fall of 1957 and helped desegregate one of the nation's largest schools. Green became the only senior among the nine African-Americans who decided to integrate Central High School that fall. Green made history on September, uh, May 27, 1958, when he became the first of the Little Rock Nine and the first African-American to graduate from Little Rock's Central High School. Martin Luther King, who was in Arkansas to speak at a commencement for the Arkansas Agriculture Mechanical and Normal College's commencement in Pine Bluff, attended the graduation with the Green family. Green attended Michigan State University as a beneficiary of a scholarship provided by an anonymous donor. While at Michigan State, Green continued to engage in activism and protest supporting the civil rights movement. He later learned that the anonymous donor was the president, John A. Hanna, the longest serving president of Michigan State. He served over 28 years and an occasional target of the protest by civil rights activists, including Green. Green graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in 1962 and a Master's Degree in Sociology in 1964. He continued in 1965 to serve as apprenticeship and building trades from the Adolph Institute, a program designed to help minority women in the South with career development issues. From 1977 to 1981, he served as Assistant Secretary of Labor during the Jimmy Carter administration. He also served as the director of A. Philip Randolph Education Fund. A. Philip Randolph, as many may know or may not know, was the son of Amy Astor in Florida. From 1961, he was a partner in the firm of Green and Herman. From 1985 to 86, he owned E. Green Associates. He previously worked with Lehman Brothers, where he was the managing director in the mixed income department of the Washington, D.C. office. He formed a friendship with, with Bill Clinton when he was attorney general in Arkansas and later governor. Green earned, he served as the board chair of the Community Academy Charter School in Washington, D.C. This concludes my survey profile of Ernest Green. Thank you. All right, Dr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. James Ely. Mr. James Reinhardt Ely was born May the 10th, 1940 in Atlanta, Georgia. He attended uh, high, uh, elementary school and high school in Atlanta. He then attended Tennessee State University in the early 1960s, graduated in 1966 with a degree in, electro, in electrical engineering. While at Tennessee State, he met and married his eventual wife until this day. I mean, on, uh, his wife, and they stayed together until his death. In the early 1960s, Nashville was segregated. Mr. Ely participated in several of the civil rights marches and lunch counter sit-ins during his time at Tennessee State University. During one of the marches, a Nashville policeman pointed a gun to his face and threatened to shoot him. Another officer intervened and he walked away slowly. Mr. James Reinhardt Ely, our teacher emeritus, departed his life on August the 11th, 2021. Thank you. Mr. McCann. 
Attorney McCann. Here I go, Judge. Good, good evening, everybody. Judge Theodore Roosevelt Newman Jr. Described as a warrior for justice, was born and raised in Alabama. His mother was a school teacher and his father was an AME preacher. He received his undergraduate degree from Brown University and later graduated from Harvard Law School. After law school, he worked at the United States Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division. After some years in private practice in a prominent law firm founded by Charles Hamilton Houston, um, in 1970, he began his 46 years of service as a judge in the District of Columbia. His first six years were spent in the DC Superior Court as an associate judge. In 1976, 40 years, um, in 1976, he began his 40 year tenure on the Court of Appeals, the highest court in the District of Columbia. In 1976, he also became the first black chief, just, chief judge of any state level court system in the United States. At the time, there were less than 12 black judges in state appeals courts throughout the country. In 1979, he was named by Ebony Magazine as one of the 100 most influential oh, black yeah. Americans. He's held the titles of president of the National Center for State Courts, chairman of the Judicial Council of the National Bar Association. The National Bar Association bestowed upon him their highest honor the C. Francis Stratford Award for Outstanding Service in the Struggle for Equal Justice. The Judicial Council also awarded him their highest honor, the William H. Hasty Award for National Excellence in a Leadership Role in the Field of Criminal Justice. He lectured at Harvard Law School and was also an adjunct professor at Howard Law and Georgetown Law. I have two quotes that I would like to share with you about him. The first of these quotes was said at his funeral service just last month. Um, he was said to have loved this quote by Frederick Douglass. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one or it may be both immoral and physical but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And finally, Judge Newman preached five separate times at Men's Day for Metropolitan. And in one of his, probably his last time that he preached Men's Day back in 2019, he, had a, he uh, preached a sermon entitled, Here I Am, Send Me. And he concluded that sermon with the following words. May the works I have done speak for me. When I'm resting in my grave, there is nothing more for me to say. May the works I have done speak for me. Judge Theodore Roosevelt Newman Jr. Thank you. All right, now we will, uh, I will talk about the Elma W. Henderson, who was a member of Metropolitan AME, uh, Metropolitan AME Church. And truly he was, uh, he fits in the category as a fighter uh, in the black resistance. Now his most famous, well, let me go back. Uh, it's kind of lost on us now, whenever we go somewhere, we fly here and there. But uh, if you go back into the fifties and, and, and before even into the sixties, most of us traveled by train. If we're going from here to, to Florida, from here to Chicago or from Chicago to the South, we took the train and train was, a, was, a, was, was just the way we traveled. And uh, if you look around and study history or, or look at old movies, you see that a lot of the porters and workers on the uh, trains were in fact black. But uh, in May 1942, Mr. Henderson was denied seating on a Southern Railroad dining car while he was going from DC to Atlanta. And in those days they had this doctrine separate but equal, which uh, equaled the two tables for the whites, one for the blacks, separated by a curtain. Uh, he was not able to even get into the uh, the seat, uh, the, the, the table designated for blacks because there were whites sitting there. He therefore brought suit, uh, not against the railroad because he knew he would lose, but he uh, filed a complaint with the Interstate Commerce Commission. And eventually the case went to the Supreme Court with the Justice Department siding on his side. In 1950, that case was decided in his favor 
And above uh, and more than that, it really marked the turning point where the, the Department of Justice began to participate in trying to dismantle segregation. So this was one of the first cases where the Department of Justice actually sided on the plaintiff side in a segregation suit. Now his involvement did not stop with just uh, that one case. Uh, he was, um, uh, he, he, he played a role in uh, fighting discrimination in the military. Uh, and he um, uh, spoke with uh, President Truman at the time. Uh, uh, he also was uh, uh, involved in fighting uh, white developers uh, who were trying to develop housing only for whites. And um, he was successful in getting them to uh, have to integrate the new housing developments uh, in this area. And uh, lastly, one of the things uh, most people don't remember, but before we had a mayor, we had a Uh, and you know the rest is history. You know, eventually we went to a appointed mayor and then to an elected mayor. But uh, he was a fighter his entire life. He lived to the age of 88, and uh, certainly should go down as uh, an, a, as an honorary or, or as as a uh, hero in the fight for uh, freedom. All right. At this time, do we have the Civil War piece? Is that ready? Are we ready yet, Mary? Give me one, okay, minute, one minute. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, now, let, let's go ahead and do the 13th Amendment presented by the junior class. Hey, good afternoon. Well, good evening, uh, Sunday School. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And it's, it's such a wonderful program. I wanted to, if we could, Janice, uh, or who has the controls, if we could put up the 13th Amendment on the screen. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. I didn't know if I was going to make it live. So what I did, I had a conversation. Uh, my wife, Shelly, and I, we had a conversation on it just to kind of go over the importance. But before I started, um, well, it's, it's very short, but before I start talking about it, one of the key points is, is um, um, uh, Mrs. Oxendine pointed out earlier is that we were considered property before this. And if you think of anything like a car or anything else just mistreated, we were lynched, we were, all sorts of horrible things were done. So that's an important point. I want you to think about that because we were considered property. We weren't human. So this 13th Amendment did that. Okay. That is that's crucial It's very crucial to know that this amendment i would say is is pretty sacred to us here living in the united states so i don't know how this audio is going to come out but i want to go into more detail because what i'm going to talk about in this is the emancipation proclamation i'm also going to talk about um juneteenth lightly as we know we got a holiday that we celebrate. But what supersedes all of those two things, what supersedes all of those two things is that is that the 13th Amendment is so important. It's one of those things that we we certainly, we certainly need to have this 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 amendment, give it to our kids, understand that to this day, 160, 170 years later since it was ratified in 1865. December 6, 1865, it still affects us today. But anyway, let me go on into this conversation because it kind of breaks it down even more. And I could talk about it from there. I just because I didn't know if I was going to make the program today. So, but I think this is important just to listen to. And it's very, it's very, very brief. Thanks. What is the importance of the 13th Amendment? Well, the 13th Amendment is very important because before it, even before the, um, as the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, what it did, it moved our status from being property to being human. 
So because of the 13th Amendment, we were considered to be property. And if you think about property, you can think about like your car. We could be discarded. Uh, many of us were horrible things happened to us. We were lynched. We were driven into the ground by slave labor, all sorts of things before um, the Civil War occurred. So as the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, and it was signed by Abraham Lincoln for um, uh, Black folks so that they'd be able to fight in the war, it was prolonged. And if you can, if you, if you can think about this, over 600,000 people died in the North and the South fighting this war over slavery. This war was fought over slavery. 600,000 people fought in this war. And so Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in hopes that what would happen would be an end to the war because many uh, Black people joined the Union armies and the war came to a speedy end. Now, when we talk about Juneteenth, of course, that was concealed uh, for a long time, the Emancipation Proclamation, but what makes it so important is, is that the Emancipation Proclamation is only an executive order from the president. So Abraham Lincoln knew that if he was no longer president, the next president, which was Andrew Johnson, he wavered uh, many times. Andrew Johnson could could throw away that that um, that amendment, and then we could be slaves or considered property again. So many of the radical Republicans at that time, believe it or not, the Republicans were uh, radical in the sense that they wanted to end slavery. So. Um, the 13th Amendment was, was taken up and it was passed. And as um, uh, Lincoln uh, authorized it to go through Congress, which we had three forms of gov government, um, of course, you know, as it was authorized to, to go, um, that February he was assassinated. So he didn't see before the states ratified it because the Constitution, you need three-fourths of the states and you need uh, uh, the, 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 the Congress and the president to sign that. The amendment did not take place. So when you look at the amendment, and hopefully um, you see it now um, on your screens, you see that the amendment has two parts. So basically, what it does, it frees us from being, it makes us from property to being human where we actually have human rights as people, as, as opposed to property that you can just kick around and, and do whatever. Um, but it also has in it that you become the property of the state if you become a felon. So that's why even today, even today, we are are fighting against that. The prison system, um, a lot of folks, when you go to prison, you have a felony, you lose your rights as a US citizen. And that was in the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, for voting and, 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 and for rights as a citizenship. So folks who go to prison end up, when they're coming out, many states don't let them vote. So that's another form, but you can see, and also, uh, you can see with many of the things that are happening in Florida with Ron DeSantis, they don't want us to know the true history of the 13th Amendment and how many people died uh, because of slavery and to end slavery. So the 13th Amendment is important, but it has a dual track. Uh, the track is, is that if you do go to prison, you can lose your rights. And also the 14th, you want to talk about the Confederacy and all that is there. We're still fighting to this day whether or not um, um, statues should go up, statues should go down. Um, you still have many folks uh, in southern states, they've already put the Confederacy in their flag. Um, 
you know, this is just a uh, of something that has still not been settled since the 1860s to now. Here we are, 2023, and we're still fighting the battle. But it's important for us, Sunday school, to study the 13th Amendment, become experts on it. All the folks who crafted it, all the folks who are against it, this is an important, excuse me, a very important amendment. And I would like to end this part of that for you to go out and forge yourself to study this amendment and understand how it still impacts you to today. Um, you know, if you go to prison, yes, you do become a property of the state and many states can pay you legally um, two, three cents. You can look it up on Google. Uh, many states can pay you nothing for your labor in prison while you sit there. I know it sounds harsh, but um, we have to become better students of the 13th Amendment, and I pray that we do. Thank you. You're on mute, Clarence. Clarence, you're on mute. Mary, am I doing the um, audio or do you have it? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, th this, I, I, I was muted there and didn't know it. So I just wanted to thank him for his uh, presentation and uh, we should all uh, be aware of what's going on around us. So at this time, is the Civil War presentation ready? Am I doing audio on this, Mary, or are you doing it? I think I got it. Okay, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Had it not been for retired AME church historian, Dr. Dennis Dickerson's inclusion on the AME church website, I may not have uncovered research on the church's participation in the Civil War. Initially, I read that there had been minimal involvement because establishing congregations was limited to northern states. Another source discounted reports from the church's bishops because their information was not examined for accuracy. However, Dr. Dickerson reports that the most significant era of denominational development occurred during the Civil War in Reconstruction. He portrays the development differently, saying that oftentimes with the permission of Union Army officials, AME clergy moved into the states of the collapsing Confederacy to pull newly freed slaves into their denomination. I seek my brethren, the title of an often repeated sermon that Reverend Theophilus G. Stewart preached in South Carolina became a clarion call to evangelize in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Texas, and many other parts of the South. Dr. Dickerson refers readers to a book by Clarence E. Walker entitled, A Rock in a Weary Land, The African Methodist Episcopal Church During the Civil War in Reconstruction. With Walker, we get additional information with the Christian Recorder newspaper, often cited as his original source. He writes, The church criticized Douglas and those other blacks who enthusiastically had endorsed the Union cause. A conscious manhood, the church believed, required that blacks be skeptical about the war. When President Lincoln designated the last Thursday in September, 1861, 
as a day of humiliation, prayer, and fasting for all the people of the nation, Jabez P. Campbell, the eighth bishop of the church, articulated this skepticism. Did the president in all of this proclamation or any part of it mean and intend to include the colored people? The answer is no. The president not now and never was either an abolitionist or an anti-slavery man. There was no quarrel between the president and the South on the slavery question. Bishop Campbell continues, he, his cabinet, and all of his official organs most steadily proclaim that this is not a war against slavery, but a war for the union to save slavery in the union. The president intends that the union should be preserved as it was when he came into power, the chief cornerstone of which was slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation seemed to turn the war against slavery, and it made enlistment in the army more popular among black leaders. The issue remained a divisive one in the AME Church, stemming from clear evidence of racial discrimination in the Union. All right, is that the end of the presentation? Thank you. And I would thank all of the participants that we've had tonight and wealth of information was put out there. And I would hope that, uh, that we carry that forward uh, uh, to our children our, and our grandchildren so that uh, our history will be preserved. At this time, we will have um, our closing hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And that will be followed by remarks by, I believe, uh, Reverend Rakeem. I don't believe uh, Reverend Lamar is on. And then by, uh, I guess it's down to Dr. Hogan. So we'll have remarks by him. Thank you. Lift every Well, thank you. So now, uh, I, uh, Reverend Brackeen, do you have any remarks that you'd like to make at this time? 
Sure, I'm happy to step in for Pastor Lamar in its absence and just want to say uh, thank you for all of those first who put together this program and all of your hard work and dedication and um, your effort and all that has been um, presented tonight. Uh, I think one of the reflections for me tonight is, and it was something um, back to uh, back to the 13th Amendment uh, presentation by Brother Corley and just the thought about how we're living in a society, although we've made so many advancements and achievements and we fought, um, but we're still in this place where we're fighting to make sure that our history um, continues to uh, be at the forefront for our community. Um, and I am grateful to be at Metropolitan AME Church where um, this is largely a focus and that we incorporate our young people um, to make sure this is a part of their history, um, past, present, and future. Um, as I look, uh, uh, as I get to, um, you know, in my research and studies on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and just look at what other churches are doing. There are not a lot of churches that are doing what Metropolitan AME Church is doing. So we're grateful for um, our Christian education team. We're grateful for our church school staff and all that you do to pour into our young people. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the young people who sacrificed their time on a Friday night, um, which is, you know, they could be doing so many other things. So we're grateful for our young people that were able to participate tonight and just all of you adults that have uh, continued to share your knowledge share your wisdom share your stories and also be able to um, allow this foundation to be a part of our history at metropolitan our history of the ame church and just our history as black and brown people so those are my remarks god bless you all thank you and thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Greg Keen. And by the way, uh, after our next speaker, which uh, I don't believe the superintendent is on, but after our next speaker, would you render us uh, our closing prayer, please? Certainly. Thank you. Brother, Brother Hunter, I am on. Oh, good. All right. Our superintendent. Well, good evening to everybody. And I, I joined Reverend Greg Keen in what he said. I think tonight, uh, reminds me of a piece of angel food cake. Does anybody remember having angel food cake when they were young? Angel food cake is a, a rich chocolate piece of cake that has a thick frosting on it. And it's reflective of our history because of its, rich, its richness. And tonight, was a sample of, of our history that is just so rich and deep. And it's, it's a history that we should all be proud of, a history that we should all try to not let die because we don't share it, a history that we should not let folks like Governor DeSantis uh, decide where, where it should be taught and how it should be taught. We should take it upon ourselves to teach our children the importance of our history and what our history is. Uh, there is so much to learn and we have so much to share as a people, uh, as the original people of this world. We just have so much to share with all and I view it as a way to keep white folks from learning what, who we are and how much we've done and how much we contributed to this country in spite of how we've been treated. Uh, now, there was a, a piece and a line, I think, in Dunbar's uh, poem. Uh, it says, you feel yourself strong. And at times when your mom told you that, it's that you were being disrespectful and that for doing that, you were going to be punished. Uh, but today is the time for us to feel strong. It's the time for our people to feel strong and be unrelenting in our pursuit of freedom, fairness, equity, and all that is to be shared as a, a citizen of this country. And not to accept 
anything that's less than the best. Uh, and to our children, don't be disillusioned by what folks say in terms of your intellect. Challenge them to prove that your intellect is less than theirs. We've always had to work twice as hard to get just what they get. But we've always excelled in that capacity. We are an intelligent people. We are loving people. We are forgiving people. And we are people that deserve much more than we have have gotten. And it's a challenge to our young folks to go for and as I said, and the old folks say, bring back the bacon. Uh, it's up to you to do that. Again, to excel, to achieve, to realize the dreams that you have and to be the best at what you do. Tonight, I want to thank all the participants, as Brother, Brother Hunter said, all of the attendees, and the members of our church school staff, and to the Mr. Ely's class, this program has, been, has presented a potpourri of all of a whole lot. The members of our church have excelled, Brother Newman, Brother Green, Brother Henderson, Brother Ely, to those who preceded us, Pastor Seward and Ms. Maddie Bowen. Uh, and Dewey Robinson, the first bishop from our church. We have presented a lot that's informative, that's instructive, that should be unforgettable and unforgettable. Try to remember where we came from and who we are. Be proud of our heritage. Be proud of who you are. And never, never, Take anything less than the best. God bless us, and he's blessed us thus far. He will continue to bless us in the struggle. As Richard said, the 30th Amendment, it means a lot to us, and we have to understand it. We have to understand the Constitution, because they, that's what they're trying to use to shortchange us in this, in this world now. I call them all white folks in the, uh, in the Congress. That's what they're trying to do. So be mindful of, be mindful of, and learn all that you can about the Constitution, and particularly the 13th, 14th Amendment, so you'll know. Thanks again, and thanks for attending. Uh, God bless you, as I said, and have a great week, weekend, and a great week. Hopefully, we'll see you in church school on Sunday uh, as we move forward. Thank you so much. All right, Reverend Burkeen. All right. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to celebrate history, not just history, but Black history. Lord, we thank you for, um, for some, the reminders, the refreshers. Many of us have learned something new on this evening that we can carry with us. And Allow us not to just sit on this information, but find ways to uh, reproduce it in to our young people and to our young adults and to those who may not be informed, Lord God, that we can make sure that we highlight um, those who have gone before us, highlight our ancestors, highlight those who have paved the way um, for all of us to be able to be in the various positions that we are now. Lord, allow um, our history to continue to inspire um, our young people so that they can create their own Black history on the daily basis, Lord. Inspire them um, to fulfill their callings. Inspire them to fulfill their dreams. Inspire them to um, become passionate about the things that will um, continue to set free and release um, our people um, to be able to uh, make uh, more progress in our communities and in our country, Lord God. 
Lord, we just thank you for, again, for the collective wisdom here. And we thank you um, for the passion amongst our members. We thank you uh, just uh, for those who aspire to be educators in many different ways within our church school staff and students as well. Lord, we're grateful for what you're doing and we're grateful for this program, Lord God. We thank you for the leadership um, here, Lord. And we just thank you that we'll, we'll continue this in the days, the months, and the years to come so that we will continue a lasting legacy um, so that your name will get glory. We ask all of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good night, everyone. Amen. And thank you for attending uh, our ceremony. Um, Excellent. Well Janice, Janice yes. uh, Eugenia, and Mary, thank you. Outstanding job. Great job. Well done, everyone. Thank you for Excellent. the texting, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Great job. Great job. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent, everyone. God well, bless. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great program. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful program. Everyone, well done. Beautiful. Okay, I'm ending it, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.